going to talk about the early knowledge level, 10 things to do before age 10. We're going to give a suggestive course of study. This will be an application of what we talked about yesterday in the seminar on introduction to the trivia. Before age 10, the child is at the early knowledge level where he's mostly dependent upon his concrete sensory experiences for learning. Around age 10, the child enters a more intense phase of the knowledge level where his brain becomes physically able to make more complex connections, which makes the child more able to handle abstract concepts and helps the child with self-management and self-control. Force-feeding academic studies before age 10 is not an efficient use of your time. It's not going to accomplish all of the good that you desire, and it may actually work some harm. Now, of course, the exact age differs from child to child, but about age 10, the child becomes developmentally mature enough to pursue studies which are more academic. Before age 10, the focus should be on building a good foundation for the later academics. And we suggest that formal academics should be the focus after age 10. If we exercise those parts of our child's mind which are developing, we will strengthen and enlarge his capacities. So in the early years, before age 10, we want to sow such seeds as honoring God and parents, developing a capacity for language, develop, developing the appetite for learning, enriching the memory, encouraging creativity, and instilling a good work and service ethic. These are the kinds of things which will lay a good foundation for the formal academics later. So academics must be built upon a good moral foundation. So first we're going to talk about a list of 10 things to do before age 10. Number one is reading and writing. Sometime before your child reaches the age of 10, you should teach him to read using a good intensive phonics method. Now a few children will learn to read at age 4, a very few. A few will be fully 10 years old before they can confidently read a, good, a, a basic reader. However, most children will learn to read sometime between the ages of 5 and 8. The age that a child learns to read is no indicator of how intelligent they are or how well they'll do later on academically. Our children learn to read from anywhere from the ages of 5 to 9, and all of them read equally well. We suggest that you begin phonics instruction at age 5 or 6, and if after a reasonable amount of time you find that your child is not retaining any of the instruction, even though he's putting forth a good amount of effort, then you may want to put the curriculum aside, wait a few months, and then begin again, and continue this routine until it sticks. Don't be overly concerned if your child has not learned to read at five or six. Uh, many children don't read until they're seven or eight. Now, homeschooling families have, a, have many good intensive phonics programs for which to choose. What are some of the ones that you all use? Phonics Pathways is a good intensive phonics curriculum, yes. Learning to read, learn to read 100 Easy Lessons, yes. Good intensive phonics. Writing Road to Reading. Writing Road to Reading, that's a that, That's considered the best intensive phonics curriculum, and there are several uh, people that have taken that Writing Road to Reading and expanded it and made it more usable. Uh, Tatris is one that I particularly like called Teach America to Read and Spell by Frank Rogers. That's a, a very nice one. Um, Alpha Phonics is another good one. Lots of good intensive phonics curriculum to choose from. Copy work. Now when your child becomes reasonably proficient at printing his letters and he's on the road to re learning how to read, then you can begin him on copy work. The practice of copy work dates back to ancient times and is, along with narration, the first step in teaching a child how to write. Copy work is a good way to practice handwriting skills, reinforce phonics instruction, introduce grammar and proper sentence structure, and it will lay a foundation for creative writing when he's older. In copy work, a child will copy on his own paper, word for word from a sentence or a paragraph which someone else has written. So you put before the child's eyes some piece of uh, literature, like a Bible verse or a poem or something, and he has his own pencil and paper, and he will copy word for word what he sees on the paper. This is the first step in learning how to write. Okay, number two is oral narration. Now, in Britain, at the close of the 19th century, Sar Charlotte Mason developed the concept of narration as a method for teaching. And in her book, For the Children's Sake, Susan Schaefer McCulley has reintroduced 
narration to homeschooling families. Karen Andriola, who's going to, by the way, I heard she's going to be a speaker here next year. She's a great speaker. Karen Andriola followed this with a Charlotte Mason companion. In narration, the parent will read to the child something, or the child will read something to himself, and then the child will tell back in, in, to the parent in his own words what was just read. Now, it's, it's best to begin narration at an early age, say when the child is four or five, Practice it on a daily basis and continue all the way through the later teens. Narration is an exercise which builds mental stamina. According to Karen Andriola, narration takes the place of questionnaires and multiple choice tests. It enables the child to bring all the faculties of mind into play. The child learns to call on the vocabulary and descriptive power of good writers as he tells his own version of the story. Narration is actually very difficult to do. Could you, without notes, Narrate to me the sermon you heard last Sunday. Could you do it? Most of us couldn't do it because we have not developed our minds to the point where we can hear something, retain it, and then tell it back. Can you imagine how difficult that is? And that's what you want to do with your children when you're young. Develop that ability. You see how it can strengthen and train the mind of a child when you start out very when they're young and, and continue it all the way through their teen years. Start small. Read to your child just one short paragraph on a simple story and then tell him to retell the story in his own words. So in the beginning you might have to prompt him with questions about the passage. But as the child becomes more practiced in the skill of narration, he'll be able to narrate longer and more detailed passages. Number three, and this goes along with narration, is memorization. Memorization should be begun when your child is young, even as young as two or three, and continue throughout life. Time should be spent every day reciting memory work. Encourage your child to memorize things such as the Greek or Hebrew alphabets, passages from the Bible, poetry, catechisms, excerpts from literature. And then your child can memorize passages of the Bible in Greek or Latin and the same passages in English in order to give them a feel for the language. Memorizing passages of literature will prepare your child for the study of formal grammar at age 10. This will give him a feel for the way sentences are put together, and it will help him to build his vocabulary. So memorization also prepares your child to be a good writer. Perhaps your child can recite his memory work in front of the family or a larger group, and this will prepare your child for competitions in, competitions in interpretation and speech and debate when he's older. So together, memorization and narration will train, will sharpen, and strengthen the mind, which will prepare your child for more rigorous studies later on. And that's precisely what we want to do in these years before age 10. By contrast, what are some things that you could do in your home that would work in the opposite direction, that would not train or strengthen the mind of your child? Television, videos, a lot of the so-called educational computer software, those sorts of things do not train and strengthen the mind. They will work in the opposite direction. And we would suggest that, especially before age 10, you would eliminate, eliminate those sorts of things from your child's life. Now, there's some discussion over what types of things to have your children memorize. There are a million things in the world they can memorize. Some say that the time should be spent memorizing facts, dates, Latin verb endings, miscellaneous scientific and geographic data. Maybe so. But since there's only so much time in the day, we as the parent will need to determine what is the best use of that time. If it's important to you that your child have all the states and capitals memorized by age 10, then you should do that. Both parents should sit down and write out a list of those things that are important to you to have your child memorize, and then adjust the list as different priorities emerge. We would suggest that passages of literature are, would be more important to memorize than just miscellaneous facts and data. Number four is hearing and listening. By reading aloud to your child, he learns the sounds of words, he increases his vocabulary, he enlarges his conceptions of the world, and he develops his imagination. We suggest that you read to your child at least two, two hours a day, of course not necessarily consecutive, read from a wide variety of good literature, biographies, historical fiction, include books on science, geography, art, music, and history, and some parents will combine narration with your read-aloud times. 
three points I want to make here. Don't be afraid to read to young children books with long chapters. A five-year-old is perfectly capable of understanding such books as Treasure Island or Journey to the Center of the Earth. Number two, don't waste your time reading fast food type books. What are some examples of fast food type books? Comics? Comics, probably, yes. Babysitter Club books. What else? Nancy Drew, Boxcar Children. Pardon me? Goose? Goose Bunk books, okay. Now, why, why do I say you want to avoid fast food type books? Well, you want to develop in your child a proper appetite. Let's say that you have a child who, from birth, you have you fed only hamburgers and french fries. At age 10, you gave her asparagus. What would she, what would she do? She wouldn't like it. And why? Because she hasn't developed the, that type of appetite. She's developed the wrong type of appetite. Broccoli is not edible. <laughs> <laughs> you like broccoli. <laughs> She's developed the appetite for fast food. She doesn't like the good food. It's the same with literature. If you have a daughter who's been reading only Nancy Drews all the way through, and then at age 10 you give her Robert Louis Stevenson, she's going to say, this is boring, I don't get it, I don't like it, because she's developed the wrong type of appetite. So we would suggest that you help your child develop the proper type of appetite, even when they're young. Now, there is a place for books such as the boxcar children when they're very young as a tool for teaching them to read. But you want to get them off those types of books as soon as possible and get them into the more difficult books. Yes. What about the, uh, we have a lot of the illustrated classics, you know, geared down for young children. The abridged yes, versions. Abridged versions. I would suggest staying, yes, I would suggest staying away from those. Number one, they ruin the story for the original. And the child might not ever want to read the original versions, and that would be bad. And really, there's no need to read those. There's so many other good books that are simpler in language, such as Lois Lenski books, um, the Little House on the Prairie books. We have a book called Hand That Rocks the Cradle that lists all the books that we have read to our children over the last 25 years, and it lists them in categories as to age. Number three is don't require your child to sit down beside you perfectly still while you read. Allow them to play on the floor with their toys, with their Legos, do their drawings, do their sewing or whatever. In our family, the rule was you had to stay in the same room and you may not talk, but you can work on whatever you want to work on while I, while I read aloud. And I will promise you one thing, by the time they're 26, they will be quiet while you read. <laughs> <laughs> but allow them to work on whatever they want to work on while you're reading aloud to them. Reading aloud is my favorite part of homeschooling. How many of you like to read aloud? Yes, we all love to read aloud. Now, how many of you have had this experience? You're sitting on the couch. can't sit on the chair. It has to be a couch, in the middle of the couch. Reading a good book, such as Men of Iron. Right. Anybody read Men of Iron by Howard Pyle? Men of Iron? Oh, that's such a book. One foot. Men of Iron is one of the best books. And the same uh, Auto of the Silver Hand by Howard Pyle. Oh, those are so good. Anyway, you're reading Men of Iron. One child sits over here. One child sits over here. One child sits, you know, behind your neck on the back of the couch. One child is on your lap. See, that's one, two, three, four. The fifth child has to, I don't know, sit at your feet or whatever. And they all have to be just situated just so because they have to see the pictures. You know, you have to stop and they have to examine the pictures just so. Do you like to read in a dialect? How many of you read in a dialect? Okay. What kind of dialect do you read in? Irish yeah. <laughs> John Buchan wrote a lot of books in, in uh, Irish and Scottish brogue and English. Those are really good. John Buchan. My children refuse to go through the McDonald's drive-thru when I'm in that kind of mood. <laughs> Mom, please. Do you like sad books? The saddest book that I've ever read, the saddest book that I've ever read is called Bob, Son of Battle. That book will absolutely make you ball. It is just, it's so, it's wonderful. 
<laughs> okay, you can develop your child's idea of the continuity of history by marking those things you study or read about on a timeline. So you get yourself a long piece of computer paper where it's all stuck together, draw a line down the middle, on one end you have 4004 BC, on the other end you have today's date, stick it on the living room wall, and leave it there for the next 20 years. And that's your family's <laughs> timeline. So anytime you read something of an historical nature, post it right on the timeline. It'll give your children an idea of the continuity of history. Number five, is family worship, and we talked about that earlier this morning. Contrary to the old saying, the family which prays together stays together, studies have shown that the family which only prays together, that is, worships together only at church, does not usually stay together. The family which stays together is the family which prays and studies the Bible together regularly as a family at home, and we have a, a booklet and a seminar on that particular subject. Yes? I have that scenario with them sitting all around. I have seven kids, and then they got the you know the baby crying all me and tearing. What do you do? I have such a hard time with being loud. I would give my right arm to have that scene today. My kids are all in their twenties. Yeah. Enjoy it. It doesn't last very long. <laughs> and read books that you like. Don't read books that you hate because that you're going to communicate to your kids you don't like. You know. So read books that you enjoy. Yes. C.S. Lewis? Uh-huh. Uh -huh. No, not a I think a five-year-old can understand C.S. Lewis. Sure. Yes? Do you read books to your kids later on? Sure. We read... You just, in the older kids just listen to books. Yeah. We read The Blue House and the Prairie. I don't know how many times. <laughs> I've mean, read almost every book, probably twice. Yes. Yes? What was the name of the book by Howard Pyle? Uh, there's Men of Iron. And there's Otto of the Silver Hand. These are all listed in our booklet, Hand of Rocks the Cradle. We also have a booklet called Lives in Print that lists biographies. Hand of Rocks the Cradle is uh, mostly is all fiction. Okay, let's go on to number six, arts and crafts. Young children learn more through their senses. They need more hands-on manipulatives before age 10. So you want to provide your children with the place, the tools, and the time to develop their creativity using art. You want to have a low shelf in your living room or wherever it is you read aloud to your children and stock it with good quality art supplies, good quality colored pencils, uh, paper, wallpaper sample books, fabric samples, um, glue, clay, all kinds of things. And then have a little table and chairs so that they can pull out their art supplies when it's convenient to them and work on their art supplies. Don't keep the art supplies up on a high shelf so they have to ask mommy to get them down and work on the art. That's going, that does not encourage their creativity. Allow it to be so that they can get them out when they want to and then teach them, of course, to keep it, keep it neat. You're not going to have a better homes and gardens house, of course, with this sort of a, a scene. But, but you want your children to be able to develop their creativity. And don't make them put everything away. If they're working on a project, don't make them put it away at the end of the day. Let them keep it out. There's nothing that stifles a, a, a young artist than to have to put all their, to stop their project and disassemble and put it away at the end of the day. Of course, at some time you'll have to put, to call an end to projects, but, but allow them to, to, to be creative. Okay, number seven, field trips and the library. Take field trips frequently. Take time to attend concerts and plays, museums and exhibits. Visit workplaces. When your child is four or five, begin attending your local science and engineering fair. Anybody here gone to the science and engineering fair? Okay, they're usually held sometime in, in February or March. And you can observe all the different kinds of projects and experiments and encourage the child to think of a project that, or an experiment that he could enter when he's about 13. Early on, form the habit of visiting the library on a weekly basis. Of course, when your child is young, you're going to start with your local public library. Teach them how to talk to the librarian, where the fiction is, where the nonfiction, the biographies are, how to use the computer. And then when they're about 12 or so, take them to a good college library where they use the, the Library of Congress system and teach them how to do research using that kind of a system. And then by the time they're 15, take them to a good, a very large 
university library. What would be the largest university library you have here? Okay, how many of you have been to that library? Taking your children there. Okay, by the time they're 18, they should be thoroughly familiar with doing research in a big university library. Now, of course, you're going to learn how to do this along with them. If you don't know how to do it, when they're small, you start out small and you work up. Number eight is work and service. <coughs> Developing your child a love for work and service. From the time a child is able to walk and talk, he should be given regular chores to perform. And I'm not talking about just feeding the dog and making your bed. I'm talking about a five-year-old who's perfectly capable of putting away all the laundry, folding and putting away the laundry. A 10-year-old can prepare simple meals from start to finish. Children of all ages can clean and straighten the house. You as a mother should not go around picking up, picking up, picking up, or putting away. You know how we can do that all day long? The children should be doing all of that for you. I don't cook. I haven't cooked in years. My girls, I give my girls jurisdiction over my kitchen. They take care of, they, they manage the whole household now for me. And that should be your goal. By the time your, your children are in their teens, they should be able to run your household. Now, along with work, children should be taught to serve. And many, you probably have many uh, opportunities for community service in an uh, area this size. We regularly visited nursing homes when our children were younger. Other volunteer opportunities abound. Our girls have crocheted tiny, uh, from thread, tiny baby booties for different pro-life organizations. So when a mother gets a positive pregnancy test, she gets one of these pair of baby booties as her first baby gift. Another area is in the neonatal intensive care units of your local hospital. Do you have a university hospitals here? We have a good children's hospital. Okay. You might look into that. They need hospital gowns for the tiny babies that are born there, and they also need bereavement gowns for the babies that die. Number nine is discipline. Some people wonder why we talk about discipline in a seminar on classical education, but we found that if the area of discipline is neglected, then we may as well forget about the academics. Children will never learn self-discipline if parents do not train them in it. The child who does not develop self-discipline will fail in many things, including the academics for which you hope to prepare him. Here are some questions you could ask yourself. Am I satisfied? with the obedience of my children? Am I satisfied with my child's obedience? Do I enjoy being around my child? Do I enjoy being around my child? Do my children honor and respect me? Do they see me as the queen and daddy as the king? And they are the little servants in training. They are there to serve you, not the other way around. If your answer is no to any of these questions, then you might want to reevaluate your priorities. If you don't have first-time obedience and respect from your children of all ages, then your homeschool journey will have many difficulties. Regarding first-time obedience, we highly recommend a book that was originally published in 1833. It's called The Mother at Home by John Abbott. The Mother at Home by John Abbott. And this book is a valuable resource for training young women from a biblical perspective on the art of mothering. Don't allow your child to ignore you. You are the immediate reason for why he's alive. When you tell him something, make sure he hears you. Okay, and the last thing is, give your child plenty of time to play and explore. Okay, what have I left out? Math. I've left out math, right. Okay. We'll talk about that next. Okay, we'll go to that next chart, the, ten, the later knowledge level. Ten things to do with children ages 10 through 12. <coughs> During the entire knowledge level, that's from birth to age 12, the child is gathering knowledge. In this later part, ages 10 through 12, academic discipline becomes more structured and formal, and the study of formal language grammar and the study of mathematics has begun. Consider this basic rule of homeschooling. <laughs> so much time in the day. How many of you agree with that? Okay. I want you to keep this rule in mind as you consider which of the many subjects your child will study throughout his school age years. And what is the wisest 
use of your time. You only have so much time in a day. By age 10, most children are entering the later knowledge level. This is approximately the age when children are ready for more formal academics. Around age 10, the light bulb goes on. The brain becomes physically able to make more complex connections, which, among other things, makes your child more able to handle abstract concepts and helps your child with self-management and self-control. We're going to go through a list of 10 things to do with children between the ages of 10 and 12. Number one, again, family worship. We believe that regular family worship is not just an add-on, something you add on at the end of the day if you happen to be, if you happen, happen to have time. But it's um, by age 10, your child is able to grow rapidly in the knowledge of the scripture through his father's instruction. Number two is literature and reading aloud. Now you can require your child daily to read something in the area of classical fiction, poetry, or short stories. Of course, many children are already reading quite a bit on their own by this age. Old readers, such as McGuffey's readers, are good sources for this type of literature. It's not necessary by graded reading textbooks. You can use the library. And though your children are now reading on their own, you want to continue to read aloud to them two hours each day. It probably will be your best, your favorite part of homeschooling. Some other books that we might suggest are Lorna Doom by Richard Blackmore, 39 Steps by John Buchan. How many read Robinson Crusoe, the original version? That's a really, that's a wonderful book. Or G.A. Henty books, those are good. What are some of your favorite read alouds? Little, Little Women. Anne of Green Gables. Anne of Green Gables, okay. The Hobbit. The Hobbit. My kids like, I hate that book. <laughs> <laughs> My kids love it. I just don't understand all those words, those names and everything. <laughs> okay, continue with memorizing and reciting aloud passages of literature or poetry. Interpretive reading is a, a simple method to ease students into speech and debate. It accustoms them to standing before an audience and practicing eye contact. Eye contact. Formal speech and debate competitions will include categories for interpretive reading. Number three is history. History is a very large subject with very many variables. By age 10, your child should be reading from history and narrating it back to you. Biographies, autobiographies, and historical fiction are ideally suited for this purpose. And of course, you can search the library for many of these books. You may study history in chronological order, or you may wish to study history according to interest, keep it interest directed, or you may do both, depending upon your goals in history. A chronological study of history would begin in the most ancient time and work period by period up to modern times. For many, this is an ideal way to study history. Some study all of history in two years, so others stretch it out to three, or others into four years. If you haven't studied history in any chronological order, then you may choose to begin when your oldest has turned 10, or you may wish to delay a chronological study till later. A mother with only one or two children can probably organize a chronological study of history pretty easily. However, as you add more children, especially little ones, your study of history may lose some of its chronological character, and it may take some interest-directed side streets, at least until the little children add some years. So your timeline will serve to correct some of the possible discontinuity of your approach by displaying the continuity of history. So don't be worried if you can't do a strict chronological study of history. It's not going to kill your kids if you can't. If you want to keep it interest directed, that's just fine. A history textbook such as Streams of Civilization may serve as your framework and guide you while you work through a chronological study of history. But of course, the textbook is only going to be your framework your skeleton upon which you'll add other history sources. You should supplement the history textbook with reading primary sources, biographies, autobiographies, journals, and historical fiction. And we'll discuss the primary sources later. Okay, I'm going to skip the history notebook, go into history fairs and contests. Reading and studying history is uh, a favorite part of our homeschooling. For many years, our family organized a history fair for homeschoolers, and each year our children from about ages 10 on up were required to produce a history project. 
In preparing a history project, the child will perfect his library research skills. A history project can involve any number of things. Ours generally looks somewhat like a science fair project with a three-sided display, and we'd have pictures, timelines, genealogies, and all sorts of things, reports, and, and uh, other kinds of data, depending on what your project is about. The children would dress in appropriate costume and would display different kinds of artifacts. After presenting the project at the history fair, then we often took it to the library for additional display. We have a list in our book, uh, Teaching the Trivium, that has a list of contests open to homeschoolers, and some of those are history contests that you can enter. Now, copy work and dictation. No, we're on composition, number four is composition. Okay. Now, by age 10, the student should be proficient at copy work. Remember, copy work is you put before the children's eyes, what you want them to copy word for word. Now, about age 10, they might be ready to go on to dictation. Some children can go on to dictation at 10. Some children can do it earlier. Some children are later than age 10. Dictation is a little bit more difficult than copy work because now the mother will say aloud what she wants the child to write down. So the child will listen and hear it, and then they will write down what they hear. So do you see how that's a little bit more difficult than actually seeing it and writing it down? They have to hear it and they have to visualize it in their head and then they have to write it down. And some children at age 10 just aren't ready for dictation. Some are ready much earlier than that. The next step in the process of learning to write is journals and letters to relatives and pen pals. Now here the child combines the skill of copy work with that of narration, narration, and he now has to create in his mind what he puts on his paper. So when he writes in his journal, he has to not only write it, but he has to create it in his mind. He has to think it up, he has to think up the sentence, and then he has to write it down. And that's another step past dictation, copy work, dictation, creative writing. And some little boys simply don't, can't do it at age 10. They just can't think of a thing to write about. And also, they're allergic to pencils, too, but that's not their same <laughs> So, say a letter to grandma could start out with copy work. You would, you, the mother would write the letter, and the child would copy it. The next step would be mother dictates the letter to grandma. The third step, the child would create the letter to grandma. So it's a step-by-step -step progression, and you have to determine in your mind when your child is ready for the next step. Simple outlining skills. Most families will need help in teaching outlining skills. We've probably forgotten it since we were in school. And this may be included in your writing curriculum, or you may wish to buy a book on how to do outlining. You would begin to teach outlining skills perhaps at around age 12. Number five, any questions so far? Okay, number five is spelling and English grammar. By age 10, your child can comprehend the abstract grammatical concepts of noun, verb, and direct object, and English grammar, or any language grammar, can be readily learned. We would recommend beginning at about age 10. The abstract concepts of formal math and formal grammar are best left until the child is developmentally ready to handle them. Before age 10, memorization, narration, Reading aloud and copy work will build a solid foundation for the study of formal grammar at age 10. In the, the recent edition of Homeschooling Today magazine, there's an article by Ruth Bichick, excellent article, and she talks about delaying formal grammar and the reasons behind that. Okay, number six is Latin and Greek. You can introduce your children to alphabets at a very early age. Remember we talked about that uh, earlier today. If you haven't done it by the later knowledge level, we suggest that the time is slipping away for you to do this. The Greek alphabet can be learned right along with the English alphabet. When the child is skilled in writing the Greek alphabet, then copy work exercises can include passages from the Greek New Testament. Latin grammar can begin at age 10 or 11, and Greek grammar you could begin at that same time also. A suggested course of study for, if, let's say you want to do two languages, you determine you want to do both Greek and Latin. A suggestion would be start with the, Latin, the Greek alphabet when they're young, when they're very young, just stick with the alphabet, and then when they're 10, go to Latin grammar. Now the Latin alphabet is learned very quickly, so you don't have to spend an extraordinary amount of time on the Latin alphabet. So 
So about age 10, Latin grammar. And then about age 13, you can go to Greek grammar. That's if you want to do both languages. Question. Yes? Are you recommending teaching English grammar at the same time you're teaching Latin grammar? Yes, yes. So you're learning what a noun and an adjective is in both languages at the same time. Yes, you can do that, yes. And we would suggest uh, three years of English grammar would be plenty, 10, 11, and 12. And then you might want to, you might be able to drop English grammar because you'll be studying more Latin or Greek grammar. A 10-year-old could spend maybe 15 minutes a day on Latin, while a 12-year-old might increase that to 30 minutes a day. Okay. Number seven is early logic. Now, by age 10, children are in the later knowledge level, and they're capable of only elementary logic activities. A formal course in logic would be beyond their developmental capacity. There are a number of early logic activities which may be helpful. So there's a, a workbook series called Building Thinking Skills. And a 10-year-old could do Building Thinking Skills Book 2. An 11-year-old could do Building Thinking Skills Book 3, Figural. And a 12-year-old could do Building Thinking Skills Book 3, Verbal. These are early logic activities. These aren't real logic. They're just early logic or pre-logic to pre help prepare you for the study of logic when they're uh, in about age 13. Building thinking skills. All, this is all in our catalog. You can see it in our catalog. Now, arithmetic, number eight. A 10-year-old is perfectly capable of jumping right into a sixth grade math textbook with no previous experience with math workbooks or textbooks. Skipping kindergarten through fifth grade in math will in no way hinder your child's success in math. You don't need to wear out your child's interest and your own patience, getting him to understand his brain is not yet wired to, to handle. Waiting until age 10, when your child is developmentally prepared to handle mathematical concepts readily, makes instruction in arithmetic very easy. What was painfully spread over five previous years may here be compressed painlessly into as little time as a month. Now, we're not saying that you keep your child away from numbers before age 10. We're not saying that. Children encounter numbers all the time. If you encourage <coughs> learning, then they'll be asking plenty of questions, and you have plenty of opportunities for informal instruction in numbers and measurements. So what we're suggesting is you keep instruction in arithmetic informal before age 10. And we list several. Uh, suggestions on what we mean by informal math in our book, Teaching the Trivia, and also on our webpage. But we would not encourage formal workbook instruction before age 10 unless the child shows a genuine interest and a genuine competency to handle the, the work. Before age 10, the child is largely acquiring the verbal skills of language, and your time is better spent developing his vocabulary, which is the primary index of intelligence. Remember that rule. There's only so much time in the day. Your time may be much better spent reading aloud to your child books, reading aloud books, than struggling with math concepts which he's just not developmentally prepared to handle. There's an article in uh, Homeschooling Today magazine back in September, October 1995. It's called A Solution to Our Math Problem. And she explains it this way. You have a kindergarten daughter age five, and you give her a kindergarten math workbook, and she does okay with that because it's basically shapes and colors and things. And then first grade comes along, and she give her a first grade math workbook. She comes across such concepts as place value. She has no idea what place value means, but because she's reasonably bright, she can figure out the procedure to get the correct answer. But she never really feels on top of things after that because math becomes a torturous, procession of memorizing procedures. And what we're suggesting, we're only suggesting, is that why not wait till the child is 10 and introduce these abstract concepts like place value and fractions and those sorts of things. Introduce them at age 10 and they catch on to them in a snap. And you, you've, you've saved a lot of time before age 10. You can spend that time reading aloud to the children rather than spending an hour each day trying to get them to do math that they don't really understand. But if you have a child who is very precocious and understands the math concepts. You know he's understanding them. 
and wants to do math, and you feel it is a good use of your time, then by all means do math workbooks. We're just suggesting that perhaps you could delay formal instruction in math. Now, any questions? Yes? Multiplication chart? Multiplication. Well, that's, you have to determine if that's an important thing for your children to be memorized, have memorized. In our family, I required them to have addition and subtraction memorized by, I think um, I was 11, or oh, 10 or 11, and then multiplication and division by 12. So it is important to have them memorized. The question is when to have them memorized, so you need to determine that in your own mind. Any other questions on math? I'm sure you have questions on this. <laughs> I'm sure you talked about it in your book, so I bought it, so I'll read about it. But uh, how did you come to this conclusion? Did you get married and say, we're not going to teach our children math until they're 10? No, we didn't come up with this idea. This is not some original idea with us. Uh, Raymond Moore first verbalized the idea of delaying formal math. And at first, when Nathan was, see, 1980, when we were doing a, we bought a, a canned curriculum in 1980, and he was four and a half. And a math was a math work. I think there was even two math workbooks. And uh, I had read Raymond Moore before then. I thought he was a quack. And I threw his books away because he didn't know. And he didn't know my boy. My boy was brilliant. <laughs> <laughs> and we were going to get him through high school by the time he was 12. <laughs> so we did kindergarten, first grade, second grade with a big stack of books. And he did well. He, to pass the tests and all those sorts of things, and he also cried every single day. Oh. It was horrible. By the end of that third year, I started to realize that Randy Moore might know something about this idea of delaying formal math. <laughs> we read his books, and our philosophy of education has sort of evolved over the years. And just a couple of years ago, we did some research on the actual history of teaching math, and you can read that article on our website. I think it might be in our book, too. Right. And delaying formal math, long ago, they did not teach math to young children. This is a new concept in the last hundred years. So you see, your, your children can start sixth grade math when they're 10 and go all the way through calculus by the time they're 18. Okay, number nine, is science. The knowledge level is the observation level of science. So you want to provide your child with the time, the tools, and the opportunities for experimental observation and exploration. For the later knowledge level, studies in science could remain interest-directed, supplemented with experiments, collections, nature studies, copy work, art, and reading. I'm going to skip some of this because we aren't going to have time to get through all of this. Okay, let's go on to the understanding level. Ten things to do with children ages 13 through 15. When children reach the understanding level, homeschooling becomes more interesting. Early teens are developing into thinking, reasoning, questioning creatures. They no longer are content to know what happened, they want to know why. But at the understanding level, many parents become distressed because the curriculum is becoming more difficult and the children are asking, asking more complex questions. As a result, many parents give up on homeschooling and send their children off to a classroom school. But this is not the time to give up. We encourage parents to persevere to the end. Remember. Homeschooling is for parents. The children are just coming along for the ride. <laughs> we now have the opportunity to learn things as we teach them to our children. Number one is family worship. Again, in the understanding level, the child should be developing theologically. He does not just know what the Bible says, the storyline. He's developing an idea of what it means, the more subtle connections and their implications. The child begins to ask questions, and the father needs to learn the answers. The father will be challenged to become the resident theologian. Number two, reading aloud. You want to continue to read aloud to all your children for a couple of hours each day. Read from a wide variety of literature and continue with the narration. Any questions so far? Number three is history and literature. Now we're combining the study of history and literature in the understanding level because they really complement each other. We're going to talk about eight key elements to the study of history and literature, whether you study it chronologically or you just continue with interest directed. Eight is eight elements. Number one, a history textbook, such as Streams of Civilization or whatever history textbook that you prefer, can be used as a framework for your history studies. It will be your guide. 
to give you an idea on what to study and it will help keep you on track if you're studying history chronologically. Number two, you want to consult primary sources as often as possible. And this includes literature written during the time period being studied, such as fiction, essays, plays, or orations. For example, when you study early American history, you want to read Bradford's History of Plymouth Plantation. When you study the history of the American Constitution, you want to read the Constitution, the Federalist Papers, Anti-Federalist Papers. When you study Greek history, you want to read Xenophon's Anabasis. Your child could write outlines or narrations or summaries of these pieces of literature. Now, some will wonder how to coordinate the historical time periods with the primary sources and literature. Today, we have <coughs> numerous sources, resources, which can help us. Unit study curricula, such as Konos or Beautiful Feet, <coughs> Mystery of History, Tapestry of Grace, all of these are very useful in coordinating your studies of history and literature. There is a workbook series called Critical Thinking in U.S. History, which will teach students how to apply logic to history by analyzing and evaluating primary sources. This is a page out of Critical Thinking in U.S. History. Who fired first at Lexington Green? It was either the British or the colonists. And they will provide you, this, this chapter, they will provide you with some primary sources, sworn testimony, depositions, diary excerpts of people who are actually there and then you learn to analyze those primary sources and decide, does the author have a bias? Is it a primary or secondary source? And this will help you in your study of history. Number three, a timeline will serve the student well to locate events in the overall scheme of time in relation to other events. Of course, you'll probably have begun your timeline back in the early knowledge level. Number four, you want to consult maps, historical atlases, and globes. Number five, each child should maintain an organized history notebook filled with his notes, outlines, drawings, essays, and narrations. Number six, read aloud biographies, autobiographies, journals of people who lived during the historical period that you're studying. Number seven, you want to read historical fiction and other nonfiction books from the library for the era in which you're studying. And number eight, the most important one, I think, is turn your study of history and literature into a project. Okay, I'm going to have to skip over some of this here. Okay, number four is composition. Now in the understanding level, the child is capable of more difficult composition, including written narration, advanced outlining and writing summaries, essays and creative writing. And I'm just going to go over written narration. Written narrations are similar to oral narrations, except now that the pencil is in the child's hand and the paper is on their desk and their mind must work. This, here's an excerpt from How I Taught Myself to Write from the autobiography of Benjamin Franklin. And this will give you an idea of how other people use written narration to teach themselves how to write. And I'm going to quote here from Benjamin Franklin. From a child, I was fond of reading, and all the little money that came into my hands was ever laid out in books. Pleased with the Pilgrim's Progress, my first collection was of John Bunyan's works in separate little volumes. I afterwards sold them to enable me to buy Burton's historical collections. An acquaintance with the apprentices of booksellers enabled me sometimes to borrow a small one, which I was careful to return, soon and clean. Often I sat up in my room reading the greater part of the night when the book was borrowed in the evening. About this time, I met with an odd volume of The Spectator. I bought it, read it over and over, and was much delighted with it, and I thought the writing excellent and wished it possible to imitate it. With this view, I took some of the papers, and making short hints of the sentiment in each sentence, laid them by a few days, and then without looking at the book, tried to complete the papers again by expressing each hinted sentiment at length. So what he did was he would take a piece of classical literature, and he would read it several times, and then he would put it aside, and he would write it in his own words. He would, he would reproduce it in his own words. This is how Benjamin Franklin taught himself how to write. It's also how several other great writers, their, the procedure they used. And you can use this also in your home school. Have your child pick a piece of classical literature. Just start small with a small paragraph. Have him read it several times, lay it aside, and write it in his own words. This is an exercise that he can practice say two or three times a week.
Okay, number five is speech and debate. Uh, in the knowledge level, the student practiced interpretation on a regular basis. Now in the understanding level, he will continue with interpretation and he might add speech and possibly debate. Number six is languages. Now children in the understanding level should continue studying Latin grammar and may now add Greek grammar if you're doing two languages. You want to continue with the language notebooks. You might want to drop English grammar since you're going to be studying uh, foreign language grammar. <coughs> Number seven is logic. Okay, now they're ready to study formal logic, real logic. Age 13 is an ideal time to begin the study of formal and informal logic. Here's our general recommendation for studying the subject of logic. At age, remember you've been doing building thinking skills from 10 through 12. Now age 13, you can start with The Fallacy Detective. That's a book that our sons wrote, The Fallacy Detective. And it's a good introduction to the study of formal logic. Very easy to use. You're studying just uh, fallacies. Age 14, you can start with Critical Thinking, book one. Age 15, Critical Thinking, book two. Remember I talked about yesterday how learning logic is something like learning how to swim. You start by wading in and going into the deeper water, and then you go into the deepest water after you've learned to swim. So same with logic, you start with the fallacy detective and then go into critical thinking. Later when the child is about 16, in the rhetoric stage, then you can go into introductory logic video course. But I wouldn't do that course uh, until you've done some of these others before that. Mathematics, we'll skip that. Science here. One thing I want to say about science is um, Jay Wiles, Exploring Creation series by Jay Wiles are an excellent science course, self-teaching science course. He's got biology, chemistry, physics, several other courses that we would recommend. What is the name of the author again? Pardon me? What is the name of the author? J J Y Weil, W-I-L-E, Exploring Creation. And Apologia, Apologia, yes, Educational Ministries. And he has, he has something before biology, general, general, general science, and then biology, chemistry, physics, advanced, uh, advanced chemistry, advanced physics, and advanced biology. Those are all excellent courses. And the nice thing about them is they're self-teaching. The children can do it on their own, and also their laboratory science courses. Okay, let's... I think we're done here. Let's, we, do, we covered the academics now for the understanding level, but there's more to say. The classical homeschool, as you can see, is not just Latin and logic. It's a way of life. And we've made our share of mistakes in our homeschooling. Here's one of them. Fathers should be more than figuratively the head of your school. Children in the understanding level need their father. Of course, children of all ages need their father's attention, but the early teens even more so. We've not always been aware of this in our own family. I wish we could go back and do things right, but perhaps others can learn from our mistakes. If your little boy is supposed to be writing out his spelling words, but Daddy needs him to help with the lawnmower, by all means, let the lawnmower win, because Daddy only has so much time with the children, so make the best use of it. We suggest that fathers assume the task of teaching the children Greek. It will not only help the children, but it will help him in the study of God's Word and in numerous other ways. Also, logic is best taught by the father. Now here's an excerpt from an essay our oldest son Nathaniel wrote some years ago. When I was about 13, my parents announced that we were going to study logic. What thoughts flitted through my anti-intellectual mind, I cannot rightly say, but I imagine they were not good. Back then, my father had not yet taken on much of the responsibility for our schooling, so the burden fell upon my mother's shoulders. If you do not know what it is to learn logic with a woman, how can I describe it to you? <laughs> I did learn logic, though, five times in the same book. I finally learned logic. Now, we quote this not to imply that mothers cannot teach logic, but simply to suggest that perhaps fathers are often uh, better equipped for the task. 